Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Voices uh, Terminus Show 29, our special show on announcing the winners of our contest. And it's kind of an exciting time here at VOT. We get to read you some stories or play uh, some of our audio stories. So, first, let me introduce you to our Yarno. Say hello, Yarno. Hello. And Kodiak. Good afternoon. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get into this. Sorry, we were a little late this morning. We had a big rush trying to get some of the stuff put together, and some stuff didn't work out this morning. So we're going to go ahead and kick it off. <clears throat> so we're flying by the seat of our pants today. So we'll go <laughs> ahead and uh, uh, start out. Uh, Talia is uh, one of our winners, and I like to say that this story was very fun. Uh, I had a lot of humor and kind of poked fun at uh, – us guys here a little bit as far as you know our attitudes and how we come across sometimes with each other and mm -hmm. it was it was kind of good so uh, we'll uh, kick that one off as the second story we're gonna go ahead and uh, do the Dark Soul story first I believe and uh, you guys want to talk a little bit about Dark Soul Omega's story um, he kind of broke it down into um, shorter stories like visions it starts off basically um, the main character, which is which uh, seems to be from from the monks, um, gets set on a task and has to go out and find this um, hidden tomb of some sorts. Like, and he, on, along his adventure, he meets up on the individual members of the group. But we do have to say that one member is missing in that story. That's Kodiak. But um, Dark Soul Omega will bring that um, character in on chapter two because he left an open end and. Um, He's actually agreed to carry on writing a second chapter, and we'll take it from there. Cool. Sounds good. And we want to thank everyone who uh, entered the uh, contest. We really appreciate you guys' time and effort. And uh, we read through them. It was a long process, but we were trying to figure out, you know, the different techniques everybody used and, and what really uh, stuck out to us the most. So, uh, Dark Soul and Talia, thank you very much for your stories. They were wonderful to read, and you guys will get to actually enjoy those, and we'll post them on the website after our uh, uh, cast today. So, um, without further ado, we're going to kind of go ahead, and we're going to allow you guys to listen to the story and kind of immerse yourselves. So, here we go. All for One by Dark Soul Omega Chapter 1 Forging Friendship Rain, a human monk of the disciples of Kwa, is called before his master, Sholinara. Rain enters the hall, he walks before his teacher, bows low, and kneels on the rug before him. What can this humble student do for you, master? Rain says, head low. Sholinara is an ancient man who some say is 200 years old. Rain asked him once how old he was. He just replied, too old to count. He sits on a raised platform and fans himself, causing his wispy white hair to dance around his face, Sean Al snorts and smacks Rain on the head with the fan. We are beyond that master routine, young one. Rain raises his head, smiling. Sit up so I don't have to look down, it hurts my old neck. Rain sits up, what can I do for you? Sean Al looks at him, I have a task of great importance to bestow upon you. Of all my students, you are the one whose name is whispered in the wind. Rain looks at him and raises an eyebrow. In the wind? Sean Al hits him again with the fan. What is my task, Rain chuckles. The time is coming for what is old to become new again. No riddles, please. You know I don't like riddles. You need to acquire a tomb. This tomb is believed to contain ancient meditations for strengthening the body and mind beyond what we know. If the ancient writings are correct, and the tomb exists, it will bring knowledge, honour and new followers to the school. The only clue we have is the name. Kai Ren. With a sense of apprehension and excitement, Rain gathers supplies and sets upon his quest. During his four years of searching, Rain has followed many leads and stories to only be met with empty rooms and dead ends. Then, at a small cave in the Karga Sands, he finds the library of an old ancient hermit named Joral. Joral is a scholar of the heroes of old. After hearing his story, Joral pulls a dusty book from a shelf and places it on a low table. He turns pages after page, mumbling to himself, Oh yes, here it is. Joao shows Rain a page with what he believes is a copy of a text from The Deeds of Kai Ren. Joao says, The text is an unknown style. 
I can only look at it for a short while before I have headaches. Wayne studies the page for a few minutes. The text blurs and he sees a black cliff with stairs leading to an ominous building all carved out of the rock. He hears a voice in his head that says, Kaza Ma, what you seek is there. Rain puts a hand to his head and takes a step back away from the book. Jamar says, Ah, the sight speaks to you. A perception meant for the one of your training. The old one's still teaching us to this day. What did it tell you? What did you see? Rain tells him of the, his vision. Jamar claps his hands together and shuffles to an adjoining room. He stops at the door and turns to Rain. This way, come, come, and he disappears. As Rain enters the room, he finds Gerard standing on a makeshift desk, long stick in his hand, pushing out a rolled up leather tube on a shelf far above. As the tube falls free to the shelf, the flimsy desk succumbs to the old man's jostling, and he falls back. Rain effortlessly catches the frail man and then the tube before it hits the floor. Rain hands Gerard the tube and sets him on the floor. He follows the little man back to the other room. Jamal pulls the cap off the tube, gently removes the parchment and unrolls it on top of the journal. On the parchment is a hand-drawn map, very old. Have you heard of Toblig? Without waiting for an answer, he continues. He was the greatest explorer that the world does not know. This is one of his maps, it's over 800 years old. He looks to rain for any reaction, sees none and continues. Along the coastline, here, pointing to areas on the map, is what was once called Shared Steps, but is now called the Dead Vault. And here, see this notion? It translates as Kamar. This, I believe, is a city from your vision. This is Kazamar. Rain thanks the old scholar and it exits the cool tunnels. Back into a large cavern, he pauses and looks upon his companions. No, now more than companions, his friends. He remembers how each one had entered his life. Lexa, a scar. Rain had pulled him from the river near the steps of ruin. He thought him dead, but to his relief he opened his eyes. After studying Rain, he said, I am Lexa. Help me avenge my mate and my son, and I will follow you until the debt is paid. His family had fallen victim to Raiden Corbolts. They caught him off guard, beat and subdued him. Lashed him to a post. He thrashed to be free of his bonds as they forced him to watch as his family was tortured and killed. They sent him down the river to drown. Rain finally convinced Lex to let him bandage the more serious looking wounds, and as the sun was setting they set out. They ran up river and in a few hours returned to Lex's simple homestead. After a short battle the Corbons were defeated. Rain thought it best to let Lexa Angus run his course. He stood by Lexa picked up the slain corbos and threw them into the river. Watched as he gently laid his wife and son in the grass away from the destroyed house. As Lexa knelt holding his family, silently grieving, rain dug two graves. As the sun rose, Lexa wrapped the bodies and placed them in the ground and covered them. At each grave, Lexa lowers his head, then presses his hands into the fresh earth. Lexa then stood, walked to the remains of the dwelling and returned with a wooden chest. He looks at Rain and says, I thought I could walk away from my old life. He lifts the chest above his head and smashes it on the ground. Piece by piece, Lexa picks up the armour that he had set aside for what he thought would be a happy life and puts it on. When he completes this task, he turns to Rain, puts one hand on his heart and the other on Rain's shoulder and says, Where you go, I go. Who stands against you now stands against me. Lead on. Zephyr, a halfling, she found them at a tavern in Rulin Port. They were sitting in the back near a side door. Lexa was wearing a hooded cloak to cover his features. She just appeared at the table between them. She looks at Rain, then Lexa and says, I did not do as he accused. There's a thieving grunt. A short, greasy fat man yells and points at the halfling. She took my coin purse. The man is dressed in silk and makes his way to their table with a large ogre following him. Please help me. As she touches Lexa's hand and looks up into his eyes, it was Laska. She grabbed the purse and pushed me into him. By this time, the fat man was standing at their table. The ogre behind him folds his arms across his massive chest. The other patrons move away from the scene, not wanting to be near the inevitable fight. The fat man looks at both of the hooded figure and Rain. Move now, he says. 
with a hint of disgust looking at both of them. Rain begins to speak, but Lexa holds it up his hand. Lexa looks down at the halfling and grabs her by the front of her tunic, a look of terror and surprise on her face. Lexa effortlessly lifts and shakes her, then sets her down and says, I hear no coins. Perhaps she tells the truth. Zephyr looks at the man and says in a slow, deliberate pace, I did not take your coins. The man scowls and says, Quarl, take her, then steps aside as the ogre moves forward. Quarl reaches across the table with his right hand and finds his wrist clamped in Lexa's left hand. The girl says she took no coin from this. He looks toward the fat man and pulls his hood back off his head with his right hand. Man, and I happen to believe her. The fat man backs away, seeing Lexa's features and bumps into the table behind him. And he screeches, Quarl, end this. Quarl snarls, makes a fist with his right hand and starts to yank it free. Lexa allows the motion to start, then quickly stands and pushes Quarl's fist upward with his right hand onto Quarl's face in a don't hit yourself move. Quarl looks at his fist and then at Lexa, and crumbles to the ground, falling on the fat man. Rain says, time to leave, stands and drops some coins on the table. The fat man looks up from under Quarl, eyes wide at Lexa looking down at him and yells, help me! Rain and Lexa exit through the door. Zephyr walks to the squealing man on the floor and says, I told you the truth, I did not take your coin. She reaches out her hand and drops two rings and a bracelet on the floor, but I did take these. She turns and swiftly exits the tavern. As they exit the west gate, Zephyr appears again between them, hooks her arms into theirs as they are walking and says, Where are we going, guys? The Lindsay and Yarnila, Dark Mere, while travelling through the silent plains, they found bodies along the road, bound hand and foot, starved and beaten, slaves, male and female, human, ogre, dwarf and mere. These slaves were opportunistic, no race was safe, taking one's personal freedom for their profit. The three of them would do what needed to be done. They dug graves, freed them from their bonds, buried them with dignity. They set out following the trail of the wagons. As the sun sets and darkness covers the land, they see the tracks going off the main road. In the distance, campfires. Silently making their way toward them, they set down their packs and crawl the remaining distance. In the firelight, they see six men around a fire. Two wagons filled with figures almost stacked on one another. Screams come from the direction of the wagons. One man takes a drink from a wine skin and passes it around, stands and says, tonight's entertainment, about time. Two more men move into the firelight, from behind the wagons. One is dragging a semi-conscious woman by her shackled ankles, the other has a woman by her hair. Both are mere, filthy, clothing torn and barely covering them. The standing woman snarls and struggles with her captor, but in futility. Her wrists are shackled to a metal girdle, about her waist ankles shackled together with a chain long enough that she can barely move her feet damn it meek another man says as he points to the woman moaning on the ground this one ain't gonna be moving at all Darvo doesn't like his women to move another says and they all laugh loudly except one it must be Darvo Darvo says I didn't know this one was dead which causes a round of laughter as the men stand and move toward the women, there are three quick fft sounds. Darvo stops mid-step, his neck suddenly throbs. Touching the area, he feels something sticking out of him. He pulls at it as two of his companions slump to the ground. Look at his wet hand, he realises it is covered with his own blood. The sharp dart he pulled out from his neck is coated with a green ichor. He falls to his knees, then onto the ground. Shit, Lexa says, as Seth, daggers in hand, rushes the closest man, who turns to face her. Lexa and Rain rush into the fray. Seth easily ducks under his punch and slides past the man on her knees. The man screams with a sharp pain across his stomach. He looks down and sees his inside sliding out of him. He gasps and falls to the ground. Rain runs at another. The man reaches for a knife in his waistband and begins to remove it from the sheath. Rain kicks out, connecting with the man's knee. There is a sickening crack, and the man's eyes go wide. He starts to cry out in pain. 
but Rain jumps at him, bringing his knee up to connect under his chin. His mouth slams shut and his head snaps back. Without stopping, Rain turns sideways using the momentum of his charge, kicks out the connecting with the unconscious man's chest and launches his body into the slaver holding the woman's hair, knocking him down. Lexa sprints in as the last of the slavers charge him. Lexa does not draw his weapon as the closest slaver swings his sword in an overhand arc. He underestimates the speed of the big scar. Lexa steps under the descending blade, catches his wrist with his left hand, then grips the slaver with the throat with the other. The last standing slaver makes a move to stab Lexa by lunging past his friend. Lexa easily shoves the slaver he is holding into the path of the blade. As the blade emerges out of the slaver's chest, Lexa shoves now the dead man into the attacker, catching the slaver by surprise who is still wondering how he stabbed his friend. He stumbles into the fire, his dead companion on top of him. He struggles to free himself as he is burning, realising the screams are his own. The scars place one foot on his body above him, pinning him, and he has drawn his weapon. The last thing he sees is the point of the scar's sword as it thrusts through the, his eye, silencing his screams. Rain waits patiently, arms folded as the last slaver pushes his companion off of him, stands and faces the three strangers before him, that within the space of a few seconds left him as a sole owner and operator of Philan's worker acquisitions. The man says with a chuckle, so do you guys need a job? I seem to have positions that have recently become available. Seeing that his humour is not working, he smiles and points at the woman on the ground. It's just business, nothing personal. Lexa's sword arm lashes out. The slaver's head falls to the ground and the body lifelessly falls next to it. Not to us. They open the wagons and free the people from their bonds. The eleven people, of which four will not last until morning. The dark mere women were tending to the now free slaves. One going from person to person, whispering a prayer, with a glowing hand, touches each one. The other has a bucket of water and rags. She does her best to clean them. Zeph makes a new fire, away from the dead. She finds the food and brings it to Rain. He works over a large pot with water starting to boil. He begins adding items and soon has a think stew bubbling. They hand out the stew to them, encouraging them to eat, drink and sleep. They pass out clothing and weapons they find to the refugees. They also go over what was available to split between them, a few hundred coins of which Rain and his friends took none of, were divided between them. Nine horses, two for each of the wagons and five for the riders. Each took a horse except an ogre, who was too big to ride. Rain and his friends watched as the three men and women rode off back to their homes. They were preparing to continue their journey when the two Mia women turned around and rode back. We wish to come with you, Delinzia says. Yanida and I, we owe you a debt that we can never repay. Rain looks at Zeph, who was already smiling and shaking her head. Yes! Lexa just shrugs his shoulders and spuns his mount into a slow trot. Rain looks at the women, smiles and motions for them to follow. Delinzia and Yanida smile and ride after Lexa. Rain descends from the stairs from Jewel's library towards his friends. Zephyr is standing on one foot balancing on Lexa's black helmet. She is humming and effortlessly juggling more items than should be physically possible. Three separate groups seem to just float in front of her. Three darts with a black ribbon, three apples and three throwing knives. The mesmerizing display reaches a crescendo as a song she is humming approaches its conclusion. As the apples seem to float above her, each one is impaled by a dart and a dagger. The apples begin their descent to the floor to be caught one by one, left hand, right hand and the last one on the toes of her right foot. The Lindsay and Yanila laugh and clap loudly. Lex pretends to be annoyed by his helmet, but smiles at Zephyr. Yanila sees Rain returning, she calls to him. What did the old man say? Good news, we hope. The clearest lead I have found yet. I had a perception while looking at the book of a lost city named Kazama, Rain says. We ride for the dead vault to an ancient city named Kamar. The end. Hey everybody, hope you uh, enjoyed that. Chapter 2 will be coming soon, as Dark Soul has said in chat. So, uh, it was a very wonderful story. It really sucks you in and, and kind of grabs you by the uh, shirt tails. 
So I thought it was a, a very good story. How about you guys? Yeah, oh, yeah. Definitely. An interesting way to approach it as well by mm. telling, you know, from different perspectives of how this main character, Rain, got to uh, meet everybody in that story and how they came together from different viewpoints. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a good job. Yes, Dark Soul, thank you for your story. It was awesome. Really good. And uh, what we're, what we're going to do is try to edit these stories and get them up online too so you can actually listen to the audio if you like or watch a video with some uh, images and stuff like that. So. And hopefully Chapter 2 will be just about me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Cody, I kind of got left out of that first chapter. <laughs> So, all right, without further ado, so we don't run out of time, I'm going to go ahead and try to kick this off. Please bear with me, folks. I went ahead and I threw a screenshot background in the back, so you don't have to look at my ugly face messing this thing up. But uh, we'll go ahead and we'll try to kick this off, so just give me a second here. The Black Dagger Keep. The bandit hit the stone floor with a dull thud. A gazillion knelt down and placed his hand over his battered man's mouth. Still breathing, he said with a sigh, not turning to face his two companions. The open striations in his archive body, showing almost an eerie glow emitting from beneath the layers of plate armor. Keep heart, my friend. I don't relish harming these people either, but they are unlikely to simply hand over their captives if we were to ask. Exilian turned to regard the speaker. One of a pair of strikingly beautiful dark mirror, their pale blue-green skin and white hair glowing in the meager torchlight provided by the wall sconces. Narnil placed her hand on Exilian's shoulder and accompanied it with a gentle smile. The shimmering symbol of her deity emblazoned on her own chest plate, reminding Exilion of the innocent people they have to come to rescue from their abductors. Delencia, the second dark mirror, and nearly the twin of Yarnella, if not her flowing crimson robe, pushed past her companions, making a particular point of using her staff to nudge Exilion off balance. Meanwhile, there's still a job to do. You two exchange warm, fuzzy feelings when we're not in the middle of a keep infested with these half wit black dagger bandits, she voiced while pushing past. The three companions stalked the hallways of the keep, making particular point of avoiding any encounters with these black dagger bandits whenever possible, and quietly incapacitating them and hiding any bandits they were forced to deal with. So far, the trio had managed to discreetly check several rooms, only to be welcomed by poorly organized storerooms or areas of the keep that had seemingly gone untouched for decades. Valencia's frustration was mounting. As the minutes rolled by, and both of her fellow companions knew it, it would only be a matter of time until there was a fiery elemental under the control of Delencia, roaming the halls ready to burn the entire keep to cinders. Stopping her abruptly, Exilion, at a set of doors that appeared to be beaten off nearly off its hinges from the inside. Delencia nearly walked straight into the back of the peerless shield strapped on the back of Exilion. What now, you dumb ox? Exilion glared over her shoulder, trying and barely succeeding at suppressing what Delancey called his signature cocky grin. Breathing, low and raspy, Yarnilla pressed a faintly glowing hand gently on the door's battered surface. One person, faint and fading, she whispered. That was all Delancey needed to hear. Pulling Yarnilla out of the way, she quickly flicked her wrist and sent a bolt of lightning at the door's latch. The resounding thunderclap echoed in a cascading fashion down the hallway in both directions. Or you can let everyone know we're here, you damn fool, Exilion growled, as he began unstrapping his kite shield from the back and unlatching a large one-handed mace from his belt. Delencia glanced at Yarnilla. At least we can stop stalking around like rats. Yarnilla rolled her eyes and helped Delencia to pull open the presumably now unlatched door, which slowly gave way with a loud screech of metal grinding against the stone floor. Sweet, merciful sayonara, Yarnilla gasped. Even Delencia was rendered speechless, and much to the pleasure of Exilion, who was now swinging his mace in shallow sweeps to warm up his arms. The sounds of footsteps beginning to echo in the distance. The room, which was now obviously a cell, contained what appeared to be two persons, both changed to the far wall of the room. The first clearly human male, and obviously long dead, was stripped clearly to the bone in many places, while others were slashed open revealing bones that were cracked and sucked hollow. The other beaten and broken was a monstrous mockery of a humanoid form. Bones protruded from all over its nearly naked form. Its face, covered in long dried gore, was a thing of nightmares. Laying on the ground, gasping for breath, it didn't seem to even acknowledge their presence, let alone the ear-ringing lightning strike that announced their entrance. 
It's a goddamn Biscar, Delencia nearly screamed at Yarnoa, who was kneeling down beside the broken form, her hands glowing in a soft blue. Who needs our assistance, was the only response Yarnoa provided, as she went into a trance to empower her healing abilities. Far from their normal capacity, Delencia's protest slowing fading away into whispers she could barely understand. Exilion was ready for a fight, as he could be. He never enjoyed having the cause serious injury to anyone, deserving or not. There was in good in everyone, he thought, and he was about to be forced into snuffing out the spark of goodness. God knows how many misguided souls were about to come barreling down this hallway. Exilion took a deep breath and closed his eyes, trying to maintain his calm when he started hearing a repeating metallic clinking sound that was far too uniform to be random. While Delencia was continuing to yell about some nonsense regarding some scar, likely having been scratched by something and worried about her precious skin, Exilion wandered down past another set of doors to where the sound was emanating from, what he assumed was another cell. Hello, said Exilion as he used his mace to knock on the door. Please, release me, came a subdued response. With the dozens of footsteps now clearly audible, Exilion knew it was only a matter of time until he would be hard-pressed to do anything except act as a barrier between the rushing mob of bandits and his two female companions. At the very least, he could at least tempt to free another poor soul before things became too hectic. Mind made up, Exilion shouted to the mysterious prisoner to stand clear and began ramming his shield into the door with his full weight. Delencia appeared into the hallway to see what the noise was, only to see Exilion reduce the nearby door to a cloud of splinters. Since Yarnilla was clearly not listening to reason, she began to walk down the hallway towards Exilion. Before she could reach the threshold of what was left of the door, Exilion emerged from the doorway, assisting a scruffy-looking human covered nearly head to toe in strange tattoos. Through cracked lips, the human looked at to Delencia. A thousand blessings upon you, my... Ox! Company! yelled Delencia as she flung a fireball down the hallway that erupted in a flash followed by several surprised screams. Exilion sat the human down, just inside the cell, as quickly as he was able to, where Yonilla was still huddled over the form of some creature he hadn't seen before. But there was no time for that. Footsteps were once again echoing from down the hallway. Now accompanied by shouts of at least half a dozen individuals, he turned to resume his place as a steel blockade. The human grabbed Exilion's arm and pulled until his face was within reach. The human was chanting softly and tracing symbols on Exilion's forehead. And you would be, Exilion asked as he felt his arms swelling with intoxicating strength as his armor and weapons began the feeling as light as a feather. Kodiak, replied the human as he slowly slipped into unconsciousness. Exilion stood to his full height, feeling stronger and faster than ever before. He stepped out into the hallway to hold back the tidal wave of bodies so Delencia could indiscriminately vent her frustration from a safe distance. Taking position several feet from the cell that housed Yarnilla and the two former prisoners, Exilion and Delencia could clearly see the mob headed for them. The bandits, all dressed in similar leather, armor with black banda, bandana wrapped around their heads, were clumsily crashing into each other, trying to be the first in line to skewer the intruders. Delencia cast one of her few spells that were defensive in nature, surprising Exilion as she wreathed him in a shield of flame to deliver a nasty burn to any that would venture within striking distance. Once the mob was within six feet of their position, an Exilion sprinted shield first into the oncoming crowd as an almost cackling Delencia sent a trio of fireballs soaring just overhead. Exilion could no longer contain his grin as his shield met the leading bandits and sent them crashing backwards into their bloodthirsty companions. Like leaves caught in a windstorm, Yarnilla slowly came out of her healing trance, her eyes rolling once again adjusting to the low, low torchlight. The sound of battle being joined not far outside the cell caused her heart to skip a beat. Did she spend too much time in her trance? Was Exilion and Delencia in need of her? Did she even manage to save this poor creature? Suddenly, she realized that the creature previously lying on the floor was now standing in front of her, stretching his newly knitted bones and regenerated muscles. She stood, her head barely level in its shoulders. It was slightly larger than an Exilion, and now Yarnilla had realized for the first time what Delancey was fussing about. This was a scar. If nightmares could have nightmares, the scar would dominate the landscape utterly and entirely. The bone spikes, protruding from numerous places, combined with talons on both of its hands and feet. Jagged teeth, red leathery skin, and a lipless mouth create a visage 
that made Yarnilla think she had indeed made a horrid mistake. The scar now satisfied that its wounds were full healed and seemed more interested in commotion outside the cell than the two individuals currently sharing the space within. It strode out in the hallway and towards the backs of Delencia and Axillion, with Yarnilla quick in pursuit. Delencia was sweating profusely, even she had to admit that she may have been a little overzealous with the dispensing of her magical pain. Her last spell summoning a swarm of tiny ember sprites from the nearest torch should have been no trouble at all, yet nearly caused her to lose consciousness. Exilion was no longer swinging his mace, with a vigor he had shown when the battle was first joined. Now using his shield as a bulwark, and picking up his blows carefully, Exilion, once spotless armor, sported a host of dents and scratches, and his forehead was now decorated with a deep gash from the bandit's lucky dagger throw. Nearly at his physical limit, Auxilian was prepared to call on his crusader training for a final stand in hopes he would be able to hold off the last five remaining bandits by himself and give his companions a chance to retreat. A near deafening high pitched screech broke out in the din of battle. The remaining bandits froze in place, eyes bulging from their skulls. Auxilian whipped around and spotted Delencia leaning heavily upon the wall, her staff the only thing keeping her from collapsing. Only steps behind Delencia, the creature Auxilian recognized from the cell was striding towards them. Before Exilion could shake off his shock at what he was seeing, the beast stomped past Delencia, then muscled past him roughly. The closest bandit was still frozen in place, only his lips moving in a vain attempt to scream. The scar's clawed hand ripping out the throat of their compatriot was all was needed for the remaining bandits to turn and run. The scar in hot pursuit trampling the corpses of what appeared to be nearly two dozen defeated bandits lying upon the stone floor. Arnilla stopped once she reached Delencia to help her sit down gently. There was nothing her clerical abilities could do to help her recover from the strain of her magical stanima. Auxilia, on the other hand, was more than grateful to receive the healing refreshment she could provide. The human, Kodiak, limped out of the cell, using the wall as support to stand next to Delencia. Searching through what remained of the pockets to his torn and stained leather pants, Kodiak pulled out two dried leaves from a plant that was certainly not indigenous to this region and offered one to Delencia. Place this under your tongue. You will recover from magical exertion quickly. Then he placed the second leaf into his own mouth. Delencia was too tired to care if it was poisonous. She placed the leaf under her tongue, as instructed, and then within minutes she began feeling significantly better and was able to stand without assistance. So I'm guessing you've made a friend, Exilion said to Yarnilla. His smirk once again returned to his face. He didn't devour us. I'll take that as a good sign, replied Yarnilla moving to the tent to Kodiak. And Delencia couldn't help but interject now that sh she was feeling better, thanks in no small part to Kodiak's wondrous herb. Any decision concerning a living scar may come back to bite us, and he asked, literally. Kodiak cleared his throat. If I may interrupt, I have read that the Kagan account and, and rec strongly recommend you do not use the word scar. They do not tolerate its use by those not of their kind, and is likely to incur their vicious wrath should they hear it. Well, Mr. Shaman, please enlighten us exactly what in seven hells are we supposed to call it? Delencia put more emphasis on the word it than was likely necessary and was obviously not pleased with being interrupted by the newcomer to the group, despite his assistance. After a lively and ultimately circular discussion on the nature of the race known as the Scar, Yarnilla decided it was time to start moving once again and attempt to rescue any others that may be still confined in similar cells. Delencia and Kodiak were still arguing in hushed whispers which did not nothing to lessen the smirk on Exilion's face as it grew ever so slightly with each counter-argument that was thrown between the two. Several corridors and a dozen empty cells later, Yarnilla and Exilion stopped abruptly. Yarnilla slowly turning to, towards Exilion. Do you feel that? she whispered. Faintly, something's not right. With a sign, Delencia wedged herself between the two and placed a hand on each of their shoulders. It would be wonderful if you would include us in this little revelation. I feel it as well, something evil, Kodiak added, as he grabbed a slow-burning torch from the nearest wall sconce. Delencia closed her eyes, took a deep breath, reminding herself that it would be wasteful to throw a fireball at the shaman, wasteful yet so satisfying. Yarnella led the group down a side corridor, twisting and turning, seemingly at random, then stopped at the door. This one was not made of wood, as all the others they encountered yet solid and iron, decorated with strange insidious looking runes, many drawn in what can only guess was blood. Reaching for the handle, 
Yarnell's hand was stopped short and gently ushered to the side by Delencia. Not that I'm an expert in the use of arcane magic or anything, but I'm fairly certain you'd like to keep your hand intact. Allow me. Exilion placed his hand over his ears. Delencia closed her eyes and began chanting. In the span of a dozen heartbeats, the runes began to glow. Softly, then the f flare as the brightly as the sun, temporarily disrupting the low light vision of anyone that was caught by the surprise as the bright light continued to blaze. As quickly as it began, the light faded. The runes on the door were gone and swung open ever so slightly. Exilion opened the door wider with his mace and slowly stepped in. There were no longer torches along the wall and the floor was almost thick with condensation. The air was stale and musty. Upon, cr upon crossing the threshold, his smirk disappeared. Every member to cross the threshold had the same feeling of dread and began a rigorous casting of spells to provide every possible protection and advantage to themselves and their allies. No one was at ease. Even Delencia pulled out her ornate spell book from beneath the folds of her robes to refresh her memory on the particular potent spell that she sincerely hoped she hadn't need, won't need. The gloomy corridor opened up to an equally gloomy room. The torch carried by Kodak was barely enough light to see anything in sufficient detail. But two things were made very clear and obvious. First, there were dismembered bodies littering the floor. Secondly, made horribly apparent by the reflecting of the light, Kodiak's torch was there. What was there, at least a dozen pair of shining eyes looking straight at them. Exilion moved quickly, taking up his position once again as the group's protector at the mouth of the corridor, his large body easily blocking the majority of the entry. Yarnilla had sensed more vile creatures from down an adjoining corridor on the other end of the room, and threw up a magical barrier to give the party much needed time to deal with the threat at hand. The first creature slammed into Exilion with an astounding amount of force, almost causing him to stumble backwards. Kodiak knew instantly that he had to de <laughs> pardon me to hillbilitate these things as fast or as possible together. They would easily overpower Exilion and begin casting his own unique brand of magics to physically weaken and slow each of the creatures in turn. Delencia had learned from her earlier ex exertions to pace herself casually, causing fire to rain down upon the host of enemies when they grouped up and threatened to overwhelm their already pressed defender. Exilion was forced to admit, if only to himself, that even while throwing his own limited arsenal of disorientating magics at these creatures between strikes, he would have much rather been fighting a dozen ogres instead of these untiring adversaries. The creatures were, were appeared human, only with a pale leathery skin. They were hunched and gaunt. Only Yarnilla recognized them as revenants. Kodiak had dehilitated the final revenant, and then something large pressed past him. He gasped when he recognized the scar that had run off after the remaining bandits from their earlier battle. Now the scar was dressed in a blackened armor, so black his limbs appeared to float around his body, like a blank space where his torso should be. In the scar's hand was a viciously serrated greatsword that appeared to have been utterly, crudely modified by hand, which only added to the sword's vicious appearance. Delencia, just as startled as Kodiak, and fizzled her last spell, causing only minor sparks to cackle in the air. Instead of a flesh-searing magical fire, as the now armed and armored scar stood up behind Exilion, and readied its sword for a devastating thrust to Ox's back. Yarnilla threw herself between Auxilion and the incoming Scar and closed her eyes to prepare for the death stroke before realizing that her companions were shocked, but unharmed. The Scar thrust its great sword forward. Yarnilla opened her eyes, the Scar jagged blade hovering over her left shoulder. She turned to see a revenant dangling by its head from the end of the great sword. Exilion too busy fending off the three other revens, who seemed to have renewed their press on the tyrant crusader. Yarnilla happily relieved, she retained all her limbs, cast another barrier between the remaining five revens and her companions, then pushed the barrier forward to give Exilion a chance to catch his breath and let her restorative magics do their work. The scar wedged himself past Exilion, who finally had a chance to notice the return of their monstrous friend. In one fluid motion, the scar cut his taloned hand and smeared blood along the length of his blade causing the whole blade to glow a faint red. Looking towards Exilion, the Scar slammed open a claw against its armored chest. Luxor, said the Scar in a raspy voice that sounded almost like a growl. Exilion, Ox will do, and returned the Scar's gesture by slamming his own fist into his breastplate. 
Ox then point over his shoulder and name his companions, each mimicking Exine's gesture in turn, albeit with less enthusiasm and force. Yarnell's first barrier that was blocking the opposite corridor had dissipated. A form that twice the size of an ogre lumbered in the room, dragging massive chains behind it. If I keep this last barrier active, I'll not have much stamina left to use my healing magics, Yarnell warned. I shall assist in healing, Kodiak said, placing a reassuring hand on Yarnell's shoulder. Delencia chanted, causing the walls to shake, as a humanoid shape, nearly the large as Oxalian Alexor, broke free of the stone walls, an earth elemental animated and controlled by Delencia. I'll have a headache for a week, but I'm ready. Ox looked at Lexor, his smirk returning to his face once again. We ready? Exilion shouted. Lexor replied with a spine-shivering shriek. Ox's smirking face returned to watch the Revens beating on the magical wall. Yarnilla dispelled her remaining barrier and watched with pride as her companions, her team, rushed forward. The End Well, hopefully everybody enjoyed that. I try to do my best not to muffle that one up with the uh, reading. <laughs> you did absolutely fine, dude. I mean, you, yeah, you, could, you, can, you can hear that story. You can you, you read it, you can hear it, you close your eyes, and you can actually see it happen as you read through it. That's what got me, you know, so engaged in the story, the humor, the way it was written, and you could actually picture every single situation that was going on absolutely fantastic it blew my mind reading that yeah it was really good i, I love love the humor and just everything just kind of came together with that story so awesome kodiak what do you think no oh, good job both of them <laughs> very good job yeah so that's i'm hoping that was a good read <laughs> Try not kill that I one. Would have done. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be here for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! All right, awesome. Well, hopefully everybody can close their eyes and kind of imagine that going on. So that's kind of the uh, excitement, you know. The uh, a lot of heart and soul went into these stories. So you know, congratulate these folks and and thank them. Um, we were very entertained when we read them. Uh, couldn't hold back the humor. It was great. So. Definitely. Hope you guys really super enjoyed. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah, Lex, he he didn't die, but he almost died. He was saved, actually. So he did need us. So we had to save him. Yeah. It was a little disappointing, huh? <laughs> so, no, Lex didn't die. We just used that as a little bit of a kind of a, a cliffhanger to bring you guys into the uh, the stream. <laughs> yep. So, we'll have them on the website. Um, hopefully, a week from today, we'll have the uh, winning stories on the website for you guys to review. Um, we'll try and add some special tidbits to them to give them that uh, um, special touch that they deserve. Yep, definitely. Definitely, we'll try um, to bring you some visuals. Dark Solid Mega and Talia, we will get in contact with you guys and let you know mm. how to go about um, getting your Knights Pledges and how it will work, what you have to do, what you have to look out for. Um, we'll let you know. We'll contact you guys and uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good job, everybody that that um, <clears throat> that participated. Yes, they were all they were yeah. all good. They were all good. It's just these two really stood out. So they really, you know, shocked us and really drew yep. us in. So we really appreciate your guys' hard work and effort, and uh, congratulations to the two winners. So yep, most definitely. Um, yeah, we're hoping to have like lore stories and stuff like that on our website for you folks to read, and um, we're gonna try to make audio casts for some of our shows and stuff like that, and etc. So yep. if you're like, you know, you're driving to work or something, you need something to listen to, and you can, you don't mind putting up with us. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the plan is basically um, the website it, uh, was being worked on by Alexa the last couple of days. He's now on vacation a couple of days. He'll be back on Monday. He's going to get to finishing the website. When we launch a new website and everything, we will have the guild application on for you, for people that are interested in joining the guild to to apply. We'll have all the um, rule sets and regulations, the charter, roster, sign-in um, options for, for people to sign in and uh, do stuff on the on the website. Um, 
with a bit of luck we'll have the law pages up we have um we have our own law scribe in the guild that writes um stories for the voice of terminus and we'll have those put up on there as well and um anybody interested in you know writing stories um related to pantheon voice of terminus you know and you want you want to have your story put up on there get in contact with us um you know we'll we'll put it on the site and uh present it to the uh, masses and have them read it yeah most definitely um our plan is with the lore for the guild is you know if we're doing things in pantheon and some adventures we all take part in as either raids or a group we're planning on having our lore writer kind of cr uh, creating a story of what actually happened in game but kind of give it a storytelling you know side of it so mm -hmm. you can enjoy that as well read it something like that it's almost like a news feed but not quite it'll actually be a story of the adventure and and how how the uh, event took off or you know took place and we might have numerous people actually working on those stories together so yeah it's it's a slow process but we'll get it out there to you guys um we're, we're glad you guys and thoroughly enjoyed those um the stories like we did so. And if you guys uh, didn't realize or haven't heard yet, we launched our um, other show, Tab and Talk, on Tuesday, this previous Tuesday. So be sure to check that out. Um, it's a different format um, as, as to what we do here. As you guys know, on the Voice of Terminus show on Thursdays, we speculate and um, discuss options and uh, all the... Um, Theory crafting. Yeah, mm. theory crafting, races, classes, etc. And on Tavern Talk, we actually cover the latest news from Pantheon and VR. Um, we go into the forums and pick out some of the hot topics, talk about all of that. We will be covering the newsletter that gets brought out monthly um, and um, some other bits that relate to all of that. So mm. it's, uh, it was uh, picked up pretty well. Um, people enjoyed it. Yeah, I think we did a good good job. I think it was a great first show. I enjoyed it for, for sure. Yeah, um, definitely. And looking at what the chat says, Frogs and wants a like a death counter for Lex. I think we could do that. You know, create a death counter just for Lexor. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I if you read, I can't remember when I posted it. It was a couple of weeks back, but I did story time with Dal. And Savardi actually wrote a story, so if you want to hear about Lexor's death, I recommend you go to Facebook, I think it was posted on, and you yep. can listen to me tell that story. It was a quick short one, maybe a two or three pager, and uh, you can hear about Lex's death in that one. It's pretty brutal. Mm. Savardi actually killed him off really well. Yep. <laughs> she actually she actually went full front all, he went full front all, and actually took our advice to cut off Alexa. Yeah. No no res no resurrection needed. No. Nope. nope. None at all. <laughs> Poor Scar, you know, you know, ghastly looking thing. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. But uh yeah, other than that, we had re we had a really good time. I mean, hopefully you guys enjoyed this stream. Um and the contest winners, we hope you're very excited and ecstatic because uh, we're happy to give you out these nines pledges. So, yeah, most definite. But any uh, final thoughts, you guys? Anything like that? No, um, just good job, everybody that participated. Yep, yeah, good job, everyone. I mean, we'll have uh, another contest and you know other things to uh, for the community and mm. you know just look forward to whatever comes next. Yeah, we're definitely going to bring out some more uh, contest stuff and, and stuff like that. So don't don't worry. This wasn't the only contest that we're going to be doing. We'll have plenty more in the future. Um, we'd love to do the story one again. Um, we'd love to see more entries for sure. So yeah, definitely. There's a lot of creative uh, people out there that have some uh, really good ideas to uh, write some good stories. You know, don't doubt yourself. Give it a try. You know, I voted for funny videos, but you yeah, know, they want they yeah. want you guys <laughs> to write stories. <laughs> The original plan was basically to have people um, dance, mimic mimic the dancing scene in the very first stream from VR. At the very beginning, they were dancing on on the path of Avadia's Pass. We wanted people to actually mimic that and um, film themselves doing it and add some groovy music to it. And the best one that would make us laugh would would have been one of the winners. Uh, we might come up with something like that in the future. Yeah. We wanted to we wanted to ease people into um, the contests and 
how to go about it. We thought, you know, storytelling might be a bit more easy and get a, bit, uh, a few more people connected than rather have them make fools of themselves on YouTube and have us watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good deal. But uh, yeah, it's um, it's fun. Uh, definitely, we'll probably be doing some shirt giveaways too, you know, occasionally. So just be ready for those as well. So some fun stuff like that. Um, <laughs> fun facts of Artie. Yeah, that's interesting. Lex's death was based on Napoleon. Hmm. Cool. <laughs> but uh, anyway, other than that, uh, yeah, we'll definitely have future contests. So remember that. And uh, don't forget, if you want some cool swag gear like some of the shirts we're wearing, uh, go to uh, www.votstore.com and submit an order. And we'll get it uh, shipped out to you. We have plenty of fans out there who have already purchased, and they're quite happy with their products. So if you're out there in chat, raise your hand and say, yes, I purchased it, and it was a great quality product. So we try to bring you good stuff. Yep. So just remember that. But other than that, um, I think we're going to keep the short, short, short yeah. stream. So, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you coming on board with us today and enjoying the stories. And we'll get those out to the website for your own personal reading and enjoyment. And we will try to uh, church these up a little bit with some bright, shiny graphics and picture frames. and I guess we'll be signing off. Thanks again. And we really appreciate you guys uh, supporting us 100%. Uh, thanks a whole lot. And thanks. Yep. Uh, thank the winners again. Once again, we really appreciate you guys submitting those stories. Uh, keep doing so. We enjoy them. And you might be a lucky winner one of these days. So stay yep. tuned. All right, we'll catch you guys later. Bye. See you. Till next time.